Last week I ended abruptly, I was naming three sins that we need to watch out for in the preachers and teachers that we listen to, and I named the sin of Diotrephes, which is the love of being first, the sin of Peter, which is the sin of favoritism or the fear of losing favor with people, and I named the sin of Aaron, but as I was getting ready to explain it, I felt this check in my spirit that I was just supposed to let it be till next week so that we could spend a little bit more time on it. And I've spent time just praying about it. What do I say about this? Because I believe it is an urgent, timely, important message. The sin of Aaron. Now, looking back two weeks, I talked about the best way to know God is to have a personal scripture time and also to study scripture conversationally in a small community of believers. Now, if you also sit in front of a preacher or a teacher for the 40-minute monologues, if that's helpful, great. Let it be helpful. Just put it third in line behind opening scripture by yourself and opening scripture with other believers conversationally. Now, I say that realizing that many places in the world right now, you can't open up scripture. And so you're dependent on people telling you what the scripture says. But those of us who have the scriptures and we don't open them because we just want to be spoon fed by someone else, I believe that we have opened ourselves up to deception and just very ignorant misleading. As I name these three sins, it exposes our fascination with and dependence upon preachers and teachers and podcasters as our most common consumption of God's word, as our most common explanation of what scripture says. And God is saying, I'll give it to you if you just open and read it. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Paul's writing, and this is the basis for last week and this week. Paul is writing and he says to learn the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other, in one leader over against the other. He's saying, do not go beyond what is written. Do not go beyond the scriptures. Now, that doesn't mean we can't have additional understanding. It just means we make this distinction, and I need to do better at this. But we need to do better at saying, the Lord says, not I. And I say, not the Lord. If anything that you find yourself living by is something that someone else has said, and you can't just quote scripture to say it, be slow in living by it. Now, it might be that you've found someone who helps you to understand what Scripture says in a succinct way, and it helps you to memorize something. That's fine. But if at all possible, before quoting your pastor, see if you can say the same thing by quoting Scripture. If you can, good. If you can't, just slow down a little bit. And if you can say the opposite of what your pastor said by quoting scripture, it doesn't mean that he's entirely wrong. It might just mean that there's this nuanced understanding and he's swinging on one side of it and not taking into consideration something else. But if you can find scripture that says the opposite of it, slow down. Scripture is the counsel of God. And it's not just a textbook of do's and don'ts and different sayings that we can memorize, this is the wisdom of God. When you look at the full counsel of scripture, you start to see how scripture speaks to the same topics from different directions. And in that, you find a more complete understanding of God's mind and heart for the topic. My urgency my burden in last week's message actually the last two and this one is that you would actually start to open up scripture yourself and learn it so much that you know what it says so when someone even like myself if i come to you and say something that is contrary to scripture you know how to open scripture and say but doesn't it say and if i say but it also says then you can say, okay, I've read that too, and we can have a conversation about it. But the urgency is we have become far too dependent upon preachers and teachers 
when we actually have the word of God, like right at our fingertips, right in front of our eyes. To jump in where I dropped off last week, I had named the sin of Diotrephes, the love of being first, the sin of Peter, favoritism and fear of losing favor, and number three, the sin of Aaron, which I'm calling reinventing God. I get this from Exodus 24 and 32. In Exodus 24, the Israelites have already been led out of Egypt. Moses has led them out of captivity, and they've approached Mount Sinai, and God calls Moses up onto the mountain to explain how they're supposed to relate to God. And in Exodus 24, verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction, the instruction of the Israelite people. Then Moses set out with Joshua his aid, and Moses went up on the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and her are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. So he left them in Aaron and her's care. It says, when Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. And to the Israelites the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. I talked about that a couple weeks ago. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights. A long time. Moses says, wait here, and then he goes up on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now, if we were to read on in chapter 25 and 26 and 27 and 28 and 29 and 30 and 31, and then we get to chapter 32, God has just been talking to Moses all this time. And then we get to chapter 32, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, who had been left in charge of them. They gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who delivered us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord, not this calf, the Lord. And so the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. And afterward they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it the sacrifices of the Lord of Yahweh. They have sacrificed to the calf and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. We jump over to verse 19. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf the people had made and he burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. And he said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? And Aaron said, don't be angry with me. My Lord, you know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. How often do we go to the preachers, the pastors who are in charge of taking care of us? And we go to them and say, I'm not sure about the gospel that you're preaching. Is it possible to make something that feels better? Is it possible to 
say something that applies to me more? Is it possible to say something different than what you've been saying? Is it possible that God looks more like this? I don't care for that God. I want this God. Can you make for us something that's much more tangible that we can actually worship God with? And the preacher listens and says, well, what is it you value? Bring me the things that you value. And we bring him our gold earrings. We bring him. Well, I like to hear that I'm special before God. I mean, as for this whole got to repent thing, what I really need to hear now is not a message of repentance, but I need to hear that I'm special before God. And our pastor takes that valuable, puts it in the fire and forms it and says, okay, God loves you just the way you are. There is no shame. You are a person of worth. You are a person of value. You don't come confessing your sin. You come confessing your worth. God's plans for you are to prosper you. God's plans for you are never to see you have any difficulty, never to see you have any harm. God loves you. We say, finally, I've got a God that I, it makes sense to me. I've got a God that I can bow before. And I think God just says, what are you doing? We say, oh, hey, it wasn't me. They're the ones who believed it. Second Timothy 3. 1. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves lovers of themselves has our message these days not come down to this what i've called the enshrinement of self if you haven't watched episode four go watch it in these times has our gospel not shifted away from love god with all you are and love your neighbor as yourself to Love God with all you are and make sure you love yourself. Make sure you are a lover of yourself so that you can love others. Have we not brought this thing that we value, this desire for self-worth, for self-esteem that we've been taught is something that we need to have? And I understand the long conversation of that. I'll have a long conversation. But have we not taken this valuable, this understanding of I need to feel good about myself and given it to the preachers and they've given us back a calf that says, learn to love yourself first. And yet Paul writes to Timothy, there will be terrible times in the last days. And the first thing he names, people will be lovers of themselves. Is it not a golden calf? And I just can't help but want to take that and just grind it to powder and put it in all of our water and have us drink it till our stomachs are sick. Does it not make God angry? People will be lovers of themselves lovers of money we bring these valuables i think if god really loved us that he would want us to be wealthy and he would want us of, of all people he wants us to have the finest things in the world and so we take this value for things of this world for our love of money we give it to the preachers and they put it in the fire and they form it with their tools of the trade and they come out with this gospel this golden calf that says god wants you to be wealthy there will be terrible times in the last days people will be lovers of themselves lovers of money boastful proud abusive disobedient to their parents ungrateful unholy without love unforgiving slanderous without self-control brutal not lovers of the good treacherous rash conceited lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of god having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people now he's writing that to timothy but have nothing to do with those who are forming these golden calves and saying here Here's the God who saved you. The God who says you can love yourself. The God who says you can love money. Here is the God who says you can have my gospel, but you can also make it look like what you want it to look like. Here you go. Paul says, people who teach this, they're the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible people. 
And here's the thing, just to say these things, I know that some of you are upset that I'm saying it, and I can't not say it because I'm I'm reading scripture, but I know that some of you are upset that I'm saying it, and to me that's proof that you're not reading the scriptures, that you're listening to preachers who have committed the sin of Aaron, who are forming for you golden calves and allowing you to worship them and they say well yeah let's worship the lord let's worship the lord and you give your sacrifices to the lord but you're staring at the golden calf and i believe god is angry second timothy 4 verse 2 the next chapter preach the word Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come, and I believe the time is now. I also believe the time has always been. The time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. And as I've said before, I don't believe the sound doctrine that he's referring to is memorized doctrinal statements. He's talking about the teachings about how to live a life of faith. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. If I can talk to the preachers, to the pastors, to the teachers, to the podcasters, it's tempting We read scripture that says you must deny yourself and someone comes to us and says, but that's what I was always told as a kid and I lived with such shame because my parents led me to believe with their harsh words that I was worthless and I can't bear up under this message that I don't have any worth to bring. Can't you please refashion that? Can't you please make a God that I can actually worship? I don't know what's become of that other because it's not doing it for me, but can you please... Come up with a gospel that allows me to come to God saying, Father, I'm here and I receive what you say about me. I declare my worth. I declare your joy over me. I declare your love over me. I am special. I am beautiful. I am all these things. And so we say, well, those things are true. God does value you. He does believe you're worth dying for. He does take delight in you. And it's so tempting We take these things that are fine and we mold it into the form of a golden calf and say, here's your God, a God that values you just the way you are, that loves you just the way you are. Now let's worship the Lord. It's so tempting to do that, but in order to do that, we have to step over the scriptures where Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross, that death instrument, daily and follow me. They must hate their own life. It's so easy. Talking to the preachers, it's so easy, isn't it? Someone says, I'm not sure about that gospel you're preaching. Can you come up with one that suits the time better? Because when you talk about moral choices, I don't know. I really feel designed to live this way. Can you come up with a gospel that allows me to be true to myself? And so we say, okay, tell me more. What is it you value? Well, I just, I, I, I think that it's good for me to feel loved and to be in a mutually loving relationship. And I really don't think sexuality is something that we should be fighting over. In fact, I think it's kind of insulting to tell someone who they're allowed to be with. And so I think that I would feel more edified, more encouraged, and I would love God even more and even be a better Christian if I could live out the way that God has wired me to live. Even if it violates like some things that the church has always thought. But like, here's what I value. I value my expression, my identity. Can you do something with that? And it's so tempting. Sure. I take what you value, mold it together. Okay, 
God redeems everything. It's not about the law anymore. All things are permissible. As long as you love that person, it's fine. And we say, now let's worship. And they say, amen. And they sit down and they stand up to indulge in revelry. And God is angry. We've failed to point out to them the sin that we all live with. The immorality that he came to save us from, not to just give us permission to do and feel good about ourselves. It's easy to do. So easy to do. Here's your golden calf made with the things that you value. Let's worship the Lord. And God is angry. We've lost our discernment because we don't know the scriptures. We've lost our discernment about these things. And we argue and fight over and bicker over silly things that are just flat out. Like if you just read scripture from front to back, it would fail to say some of the things that we fight over. And I'm not saying any of this to cast dispersion toward pastors or preachers. So many of them are to be trusted, not as God himself, but trusted as trustworthy shepherds and messengers. So not to cast dispersion but simply to say, be careful. And here's the counsel. The things that you believe, if you can't say it by reading scripture, maybe you've added something to scripture. And if you can say the opposite of it by reading scripture, maybe you've subtracted something from scripture. It's possible It's possible that you've brought your valuables to the conversation. You've brought your valuables to the preacher who will form you a golden calf. And the preacher says, there's your God. And we say, there's our gods. We like this God. And he says, okay, let's worship God. We're all in. It's possible that you have gone beyond what is written. And so my appeal is let's not remake God to suit our desires My appeal, my appeal would be, know the scriptures. Know the scriptures. Frontwards and backwards, don't give up. Know the scriptures. Know God. Be content. And when that something in you says, as for this Moses who led us out of Egypt, as for this Jesus who saved me from my sins, we don't really know what's become of him. Can you make us something else? As for that faith that I once believed that I'm kind of bored with, I don't know what's become of that. Can you make me something else? As for this, whatever it is, as for that thing that used to be meaningful to me, I don't know what became of it. Can you make me something else? Every time we are tempted to do that, stop, open scripture, and wait. Wait. Be content. Be patient. The Lord's return is imminent. When he comes back, please don't be found worshiping a golden statue. Please. Now, I believe that in these times, in the shaking, I believe God is in the process of grinding those golden caps to powder and giving it to us to drink. And some of that is the deconstruction that we're seeing in the church, and some of that's gone bad. But the disentanglement, where I'm trying to pull out the stuff that doesn't belong the golden calves, the disentanglement, man, God is causing us to drink the golden calves in the water. Now I say he's angry with us. I believe God still is a God of wrath. He still is a God of anger. And yet he forgives everyone who comes to him. Everyone who comes to him. Everyone. And it's total. It's done. It's for good. Like he doesn't just kind of wait till you screw up and say, okay, I don't forgive you anymore. He forgives you. It's done. Totally. His grace is complete toward you. It's powerful. It's efficacious. All those things. His grace is for you. And he calls you to become more and more like him. He gives you his Holy Spirit. He empowers you. And this is good. And so if you're inclined to go to him saying, God, I know I kind of screwed up, but look at how my life was before. 
Look at what people said about me. Look at what people did to me. Can't you just see that I was trying my hardest? Lord, can I get a buy on this? Like, Lord, like, just please, please, like, excuse me. I was trying my best. It just wasn't quite good enough. I made a mistake. I sort of screwed up. And I think after we've made that case before God, I think God is sitting there waiting patiently. And at some point, he just interrupts. He says, you know I will forgive you, right? You don't have to make any other case. You know that if you just say, yeah, I was wrong, you know I'll forgive you, right? If you, listening to this, if you have never just said, Lord Jesus, forgive me, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Do it today. Do it. And if you discover, Lord, I've been worshiping a golden calf, grind it up, drink it, be done with it, throw away the valuable. Say to the Lord, I confess my sin, not my worth. I confess my sin. Forgive me, Lord. And he says, of course I forgive you. I forgive you. Amen. Amen.